The protagonist is instructed by a cunning and manipulative entity through a charming voice to complete an impossible task to kill a beautiful princess whose crime is said to be the destruction of the world as we know it. A young princess who is bound by heavy chains in the dark dungeon of a far away, isolated cabin, which only the sight of appeals to the protagonist's humanity and conscience. If the strange, cunning entity simply known as the narrator is the right voice to follow or not, and that is, if the protagonist does indeed have humanity or not. The protagonist of the game, who seems to be unhuman himself, having claws for hands and being covered in feathers, is led by what seems to be a malicious voice referred to as the narrator, directing his every move and step to slay the princess, who seems to be nothing but innocent, someone who is looking forward to be freed and leave the barren and cold cabin which she has been confined in. The story becomes even stranger when every time the protagonist has an interaction with the princess, it all ends in whether him dying or the princess dying or both at the same time with no other alternative being present and depending on how the protagonist interacted with the princess, a new voice is formed within the protagonist. Whether the voice of Smitten, if he forms a relationship with her, cold, if he betrays the princess, paranoid, if the princess manages to tear the protagonist and many more voices. Correspondingly, these interactions define the new form of the princess when she is encountered for a second time following the first interaction. For example, if the protagonist treats her with compassion and care, she becomes softer and love-struck. If she is betrayed, she becomes cautious and vigilant. If she survives a fight and chases after the protagonist to fight him off, she becomes a creature of nightmares and she simply becomes whatever the protagonist perceives her as. Therefore, the story can be simply described as the perception of the protagonist. The story is a breathing and living world which transforms the princess according to the narrative and creates new voices and entities who are powerful enough to change the narrative and make impossible possible. You're on a path in the woods and at the end of that path is a cabin and in the basement of that cabin is a princess. You're here to slay her. If you don't, it will be the end of the world. The story begins with the unnamed protagonist of the game finding himself in a forest with a singular path leading to a hill. Unsure to what's going on, the protagonist is filled with the knowledge of one task only and he is certain he is following the right path. However, this entire world comes crashing down when he challenges the ideas that have been forced down on him, questioning the legitimacy of his mission. A strange voice which directly narrates the protagonist's story and mission, including instructions to his task. The voice known as the narrator explains the protagonist is simply here to follow the path reach a cabin where he finds a princess in its basement whom he has the duty of slaying as otherwise the world will come to an end. It's already heavily implied that the princess is the culprit of ending the world and killing her would mean the world would survive. There are multiple options the player has which they can choose, whether to be sadistic and happily go ahead to kill the princess, to save the princess and dismiss the narrator, to challenge the narrator and consider the task or simply turn around and abandon the mission. Each option has its own unique result, but they all ultimately lead to the same destination, to the princess who shifts every time. It becomes crystal clear that despite having different options, the protagonist indeed has only one path, an illusion of having multiple options, having to go to the cabin as no other world exists for either of them. The protagonist or the princess. Challenging the narrator, he involuntarily exposes his sinister nature, that he is the one who wants the princess to die, and he cannot give any good reason to why. Nevertheless, let me assure you, the princess is locked up because she's dangerous. She is not dangerous because she's locked up. And before you decide to waste even more of our time by asking how I know that, let me suggest a more pragmatic lens through which to view this situation. Causality doesn't matter here, because the end result is the same no matter what led us up to this point. If the princess leaves the cabin, the world will end, and 
There is no changing that. It's no use arguing semantics over a metaphorical chicken or egg, because the egg is hatched and it's about to ruin everything. Unless, of course, you do your job and slay her. Like I said, I don't make the rules, no matter how much I win. Are you serious? No, you have to do it. Meanwhile, there is another voice referred to as the hero, who truly stands for the title, being a hero, considering the ethics and morality of every aspect of the situation, not easily manipulated or swayed to perform an ambiguous action in regards to its morality. Regardless, this is my own playthrough, and I will walk you through the choices I made and the outcomes I faced, so buckle up and let's go on this crazy ride. Right off the bat, I choose not to have any part in slaying someone I do not know and have little information about whether being guilty or not, and choose to turn around away from the cabin. The narrator, clearly showing his dismay towards the protagonist's actions, fulfills his duty of narrating the protagonist's actions despite not going as planned. The hero, on the other hand, knowing too little to take any action, applauds the protagonist's actions and leaving his duty and turning away as nothing good could come out of this. As the protagonist turns around, he magically is faced with the cabin once again, despite turning the other way and not just any cabin, but the same exact cabin with the same princess in its basement, depicting how no matter what, the narrative must be followed and there's no escape. You're really keen on wasting everyone's time, aren't you? It's remarkably selfish, if you ask me. I've already outlined the stakes of the situation. If you don't do your job, everyone dies. Like, dies, dies. Forever. Turning to the opposite direction once more, he is faced with the cabin again with the narrator explaining this is the protagonist's destiny and he must save the world by slaying the princess. The protagonist turns to another way again and walks into the wilderness, turning away every time he sees a glimmer of the cabin, until suddenly the wilderness reduces to multiple cabins, exactly the same cabins containing the exact same princess. Despite being surrounded by cabins and paths leading to them and nothing else in between, the protagonist tries to find any other way possible not to enter the cabins, walking and trekking hours on end aimlessly, until suddenly everything goes black with only the voice of the narrator explaining that the world has come to an end. You lose track of just how long you spend aimlessly tromping through the wilderness, but it's not like any of that time spent lost in the woods really matters, because it isn't long before the world ends and everyone dies. Strangely, it doesn't take long before the protagonist opens his eyes, which feels not longer than a few seconds, finding himself back in the same wilderness, with the voice of the same narrator explaining that he is here to slay the princess in order to save the world. Despite the protagonist knowing what happened before with the world ending, the narrator doesn't seem to remember any of it, denying ever being there with them before. Although, the voice of the hero remembers the last time very well, confirming what happened. Interestingly, a new voice appears, being the voice of the contrarian, corresponding to the actions of the protagonist in the previous world which seemingly ended. This means the actions and decisions of the protagonist directly result in new outcomes and change the new world. The contrarian, as the name suggests, is there to disagree and challenge everything the narrator says and instructs, doubting everything, and most importantly, the contrarian, like many other voices which will appear later, seem to be powerful enough to change the narrative, being embedded into the story. Entering the cabin as being the only choice presented to the protagonist, with no other options of turning around, the interior seems odd being made with different materials, with pieces of the floor missing, opening a gap into what seems to be the void or cosmos. Unlike other possibilities, the cabin seems physically impossible yet existing, and despite all the errors and problems, a pristine blade is placed on the table, acting as the tool for the protagonist to slay the princess. The blade is always there in every variation of the story, depending on the decisions of the protagonist, as if the narrative of the story has been specifically written for the princess to be slain. The story is stereotypical, 
there is a hero, a narrative, and a damsel in distress in need of saving. However, in here, the plot is to slay the princess instead. Based on the decisions of the hero, the story can become shifted and twisted, creating new worlds unfamiliar to the common audience to these types of stories. The hero and the contrarian become scared seeing the interior, starting to wonder what they're really up against, with the narrator insisting that it's just a princess, implying that she is harmless and easy to kill, as if saying what she is truly capable of could make her become as such, transforming into a powerful hostile being. I've already told you what you're dealing with. You're dealing with a princess. How many times do I have to explain this incredibly simple and straightforward premise? At this point, both Contrarian and the narrator agree with each other that the situation is dire, and they both help the voice of the hero get a hold of himself and do what he's supposed to do, be a hero. I'm not going to stop doing my job, so you're just going to have to get better at yours, and quickly if you don't mind. Yes, take a deep breath. I'm all for getting under his skin, but we'll miss out on loads of fun if we shrivel up into a ball and go insane the first time we see something weird. What you're seeing here is obviously real. Just accept it and go with the flow. It really isn't hard. Okay. Okay, I'm fine. That's when, all in agreement, assess the protagonist open the door to the basement, being forced with multiple spiraling stairs, intertwined, seemingly leading to nothingness. The hero, shivering with fear, asking the protagonist and the other voices to turn around, both contrarian and the narrator in agreement, insist of going down as otherwise there would be no world for them to disagree in and pull each other's strings. As the protagonist takes the stairs to the left, with each step descending, the stairs deform and become tall spikes, with the air condensing and becoming freezing, making each second more challenging than the last to breathe and survive. The protagonist starts hallucinating and losing the sense of himself as the world starts to collapse on its own, with the narrative disintegrating as, after all, the protagonist didn't want anything to do with the mission and his forced task. The protagonist losing his own sense, being driven only like a puppet with a sense of devotion and blinded fellowship, continues on, losing his mind when all of a sudden he finds himself in the basement, faced with the notorious princess. She is calm, yet shrouded in darkness with glowing eyes. The narrator instructs the protagonist to slay her, while the contrarian discourages the protagonist to do so. And the hero, on the other hand, urges the protagonist to speak to her and get her side of the story. Just when he tries to do that, the reality fractures with a different version of the princess appearing, being more sinister and eerie, admitting that she wants to end the world. The hero becomes terrified and wants to turn back, revealing the previous world they went through, leading to the end when the narrator insists that they forget everything they experienced and to unthink whatever idea crept into their minds as if the thoughts are powerful enough to reshape the princess and the possibilities. Just as the protagonist tries to ask the princess what's happening and why there's two of her now, another fracture causes another version of her to appear, similar in nature yet different in behavior, with the different version completely unaware of their counterparts. The protagonist, unsure what to do, goes on to free her, but with each step, he feels himself fracturing, feeling as if different versions of him are moving forward. That's when the different fractured versions of the princess all collapse into each other, with the voice of the narrator vanishing, as if the narrative and the premise completely disappeared, with no more plotline for the narrator to narrate. With the princess crying and feeling so much pain, she pleads with the protagonist to save her, but before the protagonist can take any action, several arms appear from the thin air and consume her with nothing left behind. The world also collapses and goes into a void with nothing but a mirror awaiting the protagonist. With only the voice of the hero and the contrarian left, they urge the protagonist not to look into the mirror, but having nothing else to do, he ignores them and does just that. Yes. Does that mean the world ended? Again, what the hell are we supposed to do? There's something dreadful about it. I don't think you should. No. 
Don't do that. As he looks into the mirror, he is shocked to see a feathered monster with large claws and glowing eyes, much more monstrous looking than the princess, which surges his mind with ideas that he was the monster all along and not the princess. The princess was only an innocent victim, portrayed as a monster for the protagonist to kill, or at least. Those are the ideas that overtake the protagonist's mind. The mirror then disappears and a hell forms from a growing flame atop it, with what seems to be the outline of the princess in place of the cabin, which means the princess represented the cabin. Going up, a scary sight beholds the protagonist, an amalgamation of all different versions of the princess, being very calm and collected despite looking like a monster in pain. Talking with this entity, it explains that it is a presence within this void which is the narrative, a collection of thoughts and perceptions without connection. I am solitary lights in an empty city. What are you? Thoughts without connections, a dim and nascent network. I wish to be more. She further explains whatever version of the princess the protagonist encounters acts as a vessel for her to become complete in this long, quiet, the void the story and the world is. Talking in puzzles and being mysterious, she explains that these vessels act as perspectives for her to become complete, and that the protagonist just like this entity is just like her, a vast and powerful entity which has been limited in this world, which acts as a prison. This entity also explains she acts on instinct and that the protagonist is the only entity and being she has ever known and encountered, depicting that she is limited as well. The entity goes on explaining every iteration of the princess as part of her and that she wants to be free and explore the different worlds beyond this void that she is trapped in. The entity then reveals that whenever he encounters the princess, each perception that he has of her transforms her as they are simply his perceptions of him. Therefore, if he believes her to be weak and fragile, she would become as such. If he believes her to be scary, she would become scary. And if he believes her to be powerful, she would also become as such. And that explains why she changes on the second encounters. The entity then explains in response to the protagonist's question that she does not know what she will do when she is complete and freed as she has never been. The protagonist then is only left in the void with this entity to wait forever or to go back to the premise and collect more vessels for her. The protagonist waiting for a very long time gives in to boredom and wishes to go back when he is killed, awakening in the wilderness again. This time around, going straight to the cabin, the interior is exactly what one would expect made out of lugs and wooden floor, with wooden doors, with everything being in great symmetry. Opening the door and going down without taking the blade, this time around, the voice of the princess can be heard asking who it is, which mesmerizes the hero, saying how could this princess be guilty? To which the narrator explains that she is manipulative and the protagonist shouldn't be fooled. Hello? Is someone there? It's hypnotizing. It's the kind of voice you only have to hear once to remember it for the rest of your life. Don't let it fool you. It's all part of the manipulation. Gazing up on the beautiful princess, the protagonist cannot bring himself to slay her. Instead, he chooses to go back up to look for some sort of tool or a key to open her chain. As he does so, the door slams shut with it being locked, which is against the premise that the protagonist has to follow. That's when all of a sudden, the princess starts biting deep into her own wrist to cut herself loose, with a knife out of nowhere falling next to the protagonist to use against her. The protagonist confused to how any of this is possible, he picks up the knife to cut her loose instead of killing her. Despite the sheer brutality of it all and clear excruciating nature of it, the princess doesn't do as much of a flinch, removing her own hand. Of course, this time around, as the entity explained 
filled in the void. The protagonist doesn't remember anything from the past world and vessel, hence why he doesn't know the princess he is encountering as yet another vessel. The princess and the protagonist set to leave the basement together, but of course the narrator takes control of the protagonist's body, controlling the narrative as it is supposed to be. The protagonist has a quick blackout when he finds himself having a tight grip on the knife about to stab the princess in the back. Just before he swings, he warns the princess who dodges just in time to evade the stab. The protagonist resists the narrator, freezing in his place with the princess understanding the situation and taking the blade off his hands and stabbing him repeatedly until he falls down, being incapacitated. The princess apologizes and weeps for the protagonist as she had no other choice but to slay her savior, to save herself. As a result, the protagonist dies and awakens in the forest yet again as chapter 2, named The Damsel. As the protagonist is instructed yet again by the voice of the narrator to go to the cabin and slay the princess, another voice appears referred to as Smitten, someone who is madly in love with the princess, someone who is not afraid to express his passion. He made our beloved brutally take our life last time. He is trying to keep us apart, but he won't be able to withstand the power of our love. But I also speak from the heart. My passions are too great to be stifled. They must be expressed. Going to the cabin, this time around, the interior is elegant and built with stone, as if depicting a beautiful palace. Going down, the stairs are decorated with gold-trimmed carpet and candles lighting the path. With every moment, the smitten expresses more and more how he cannot wait to see his beloved, the princess. Reaching the basement, the princess has become even more beautiful and this time around, she expects to see the protagonist impatiently, calling him Dashing and her hero. It's you, my Dashing hero. I was so worried you wouldn't come back. Do you hear that? She said we're dashing. And she called us a hero. This instantly melts the smitten who wants to save the princess. That's when the narrator reveals that if this is not the first time they are encountering the princess, the previous world or worlds, including everyone within them, has already been doomed and nothing has been reset. The protagonist, including the voices, just keep hopping between these alternate worlds or dimensions, which causes great devastation. Despite all that, the smitten is steadfast in his desire to free the princess and explore his romantic adventure with her, saying that she can slip her hands easily through the chain. Both the narrator and the hero laugh and mock Smitten that it's impossible as why wouldn't she do it beforehand, to which the Smitten says because his love is too strong and that they have yet to present her with the option. As it turns out, this reality is possible as the smitten directs the protagonist to move forward and free her by simply slipping her hand through the chain, which actually becomes a reality, dropping the jaws of both the hero and the narrator. This time, the power of each voice is depicted on how they can control the narrative, and how the smitten has powers to resist the control of the narrator. As the protagonist hand in hand with the princess go up the stairs, the door to the basement shuts, locking them both in. But yet again, with the power of love, the smitten commands the protagonist to push the door with the princess, which magically opens the door with minimal effort, leaving the narrator shocked. Managing to go outside with the protagonist being extremely happy alongside the princess, she suddenly starts feeling cold with the familiar hands appearing and taking her body. That's when the memories flood back when the protagonist finds himself back in the void again, confronted with the mirror. With the narrator being absent, the protagonist approaches the mirror, seeing that he has aged as if it's been years. He's transported to another part of the void or otherwise known as the Long Quiet, where he encounters the entity once more who consumed the vessel struck by love. Alternatively, if the protagonist picks up the knife and stabs the princess in betrayal when they go up, the smitten cannot take this any longer and ends it all in retaliation for killing the princess, someone he was deeply in love with. This initiates chapter 3 named Grey. 
This time around, the wilderness is barren of trees, being endless fields. A new voice is formed referred as cold, who as the name suggests, is cold and indifferent, according to the action of the protagonist for stabbing someone he was supposed to love. Arguing with each other, the narrator reveals that the princess still lives, hence why they are back in this world, which delights the smitten. Arriving at the cabin, the protagonist sees a sight of a ghostly woman in a white dress before she disappears resembling the princess. Shaken and fearful, there's no sight of the blade as it has been already used. Keep in mind that all of this is possible because this is the perception of the protagonist and this is what he expects to see. Going to the basement, which has already changed into a cold and stone-built place, the skeleton of the princess with a dagger lodged in her chest remains, a reminder of the atrocity the protagonist committed. Looking up, the ghost of the princess stands looking down at the protagonist, which shocks the narrator as he doesn't know how else the princess would actually die. This simply means there's no way to end this. The smitten, alongside the other voices, unsure how the ghost would react after knowing Knowing she's been betrayed, she instantly lights up with joy seeing the protagonist happy that he has returned. You came back. I missed you. Of course, this means that the protagonist has already believed the princess is a soft and kind-hearted individual filled with love of the protagonist. The princess explains that she wants them to be together and that this cursed place makes them keep on hurting each other. When she drops a torch and burns the place down, gazing deeply into the protagonist's eyes while they both burn into a crisp. That's when the badly charred body of the princess, dressed in a veil and a wedding dress, is snatched by the feeling touch or the wandering arms, taking care as a new collected vessel to the entity. The entity explains that this vessel is passion betrayed, but even with that, the love never faded and she wanted to be with the protagonist even after all of it. This one is passion betrayed, but even in the end, her love never faded. She will make for a bright heart. If the protagonist does not stab the princess while having a romantic route, the vessel would be a gentle heart who was folded by the memories and perception of the protagonist to love him. The entity explains that at the end nothing is clear and she does not know what will happen, but she appreciates having the gifts or in other words the vessels from the protagonist which shape her and give her more sense. Whether broken or happy, and she appreciates the presence of the protagonist alongside her. Yet again, she wipes his memories for another reunion, to go back to another world and bring another vessel to her, shaped by his perception and interaction. Despite having free will, the choices are quite limited, as he cannot make the same exact choices as the vessels would be the same and would not add anything of value to the entity. This time around, the protagonist tries to save the princess, cutting her off her restraints. However, as she turns her back due to being controlled by the narrator, the protagonist tries to stab her without warning her. This leads to the princess dodging and getting only a scratch, getting into a physical battle with him. She manages to handle the protagonist despite having only one hand, and the protagonist having the blade, which leads to him dying and the princess becoming vigilant. The second chapter begins named The Witch. A new voice is formed as the opportunist, someone who is vigilant and would take any opportunity to perform anything in his favor, corresponding to the betrayal of the protagonist in the last encounter with the princess. The opportunist, considering all options, explains it's better to kill the princess as otherwise they might die again, depicting what a self-centered being it is. They go to the cabin to see the interiors covered in roots as if being home to an animalistic creature. Going down, the princess has transformed into a feral animal hybrid, fierce in nature and ready to change any moment, being very vigilant, not leaving any side of her exposed. Seeing how much of a disadvantage he is in, the protagonist suggests a truce for the time being so they can both break out. The princess doesn't hate the idea, 
but she mentions that the only way she can trust the protagonist is if he goes up the stairs first as the last time she was stabbed. Despite the opportunist strongly advising against it, the protagonist goes up first, soon regretting his decision as he feels a sharp pain on his back, feeling something pop with the princess digging her claws into his back. His paralyzed body tumbles back, throwing the princess down the stairs as well, leading to both of them breaking their backs and not being able to get up. As they gaze upon each other, gasping for their last breaths, the feeling arms come out again and snatch her body. The protagonist approaches the mirror once more to see himself weathered. Meeting with the entity again, she explains the protagonist is just like her. He simply doesn't take notice. He doesn't see how his contradictory signs are all him and part of him, whether good or bad. And that in fact, all the voices apart from the narrator are him and his different shades, just like the princess. That's why he started with the hero voice, as he is the hero of the story. But based on his actions, more personas are formed. The more the protagonist enters the new world and encounters the different versions of the princess, the more they get to know each other, as these versions or vessels live within the princess and the protagonist remembers everything thing when he enters the long quiet. This time around, the protagonist has a long conversation with the princess or the vessel, trying to understand her better. Through the conversation, it becomes evident that she is nothing but a hollow image or a vessel, ready to be folded or shaped by the protagonist and the narrative that he chooses. She is unaware of what she is apart from the fact that she is supposed to be a princess. She doesn't know why she has been in present, what her real name is, and what she is supposed to do. All she wants is to be freed, and she doesn't even know what she can do with her freedom. The protagonist then promises her that he will free her when instead when the knife is thrown, he attacks her whilst being bound to the chain. This allows the protagonist to deliver severe blows which badly hurt her, but in return, despite being chained, she also badly mauls the protagonist which scares him, running upstairs and barricading the door behind him, hoping that the blows would make her bleed out. Despite the injuries that she received, she seems to become more twisted and powerful, banging on the door harder and harder with a scary voice, promising to ravage the protagonist. I know you're still there. Things easier on yourself and let me out. It's not like this little door I'll hold for very long, anyways. Huh? It's probably a good idea to try to get back on my good side. She sounds terrifying. Like she's less of the princess you saw and more like something out of a nightmare. As she violently rattles the door, you do your best to shut her out of your mind. When I get out of here, I'm going to pick you apart, peace. Peace. I won't forget what you did, but I'll never forgive it. You don't know the kind of enemy you've made tonight. This all starts making sense how the perception of the protagonist makes the princess or the vessel much more powerful. Perceiving her as such a challenging foe made her become even scarier. The protagonist, cowering in the corner of the cabin, slowly falls asleep due to losing so much blood. As he awakens later on, he sees the door kicked wide open with the princess being a monstrous floating entity, posing as one of the most hostile and dangerous adversaries that he's ever faced. The sheer terror and sight of the transformed princess makes the protagonist have a heart attack and simply die. The chapter 2 begins called The Nightmare. The new voice formed is called Paranoid, appropriate for the last terrifying experience the protagonist had. The door of the basement in the cabin being wide open now, the protagonist carefully goes down to find floating stairs leading down with a horrifying voice belonging to the princess awaiting him. Reaching the bottom of the stairs, the protagonist finds himself in a maze with many paths leading different ways. That's when the new nightmare princess appears with a broken mask as if depicting the betrayal that she faced, approaching him in a playful manner as if trying to use him as a toy. Just the sight of her 
Oliver makes the protagonist go numb, as his perception reformed the vessel into the most horrifying shape customized for the protagonist. The protagonist keeps losing his life, but thanks to the paranoid, his heart keeps resetting and pumping, barely keeping him alive. The Nightmare Princess explains in The Last World, Chapter 1, after the protagonist died, she tried to leave, but the cabin wouldn't let her, as if the narrative binds her to the cabin, as it is written for her to be stuck here. I tried to leave so while you suffocated, but live that stupid live cabin live wouldn't live let me. So I started to drag your body out with me and then, well, you died before I could get to the door. And then I was here, and now you're here too. I don't think I can leave without you. And dead doesn't count. And as much as I love what you have so on, I have bigger plans than tormenting one poor little creature forever. I want to leave. She then tries to take the body of the protagonist with her, but as soon as she dragged him, he died, leading to both the princess and the protagonist hopping to another world with the other world seemingly destroyed. She tries to make a deal with them to keep him as a pet or supposedly a companion and leave together, as otherwise they keep on looping, being thrown together until the ends of time, hopping to more realities and destroying everything behind. If the protagonist refuses to leave with the nightmare, she takes her mask off to reveal what she is, absolute darkness which engulfs the protagonist. This darkness creeps into the protagonist, taking over every essence of him, filling him up. He sees his lifetime passing by, actually living them, 80 years, 90 years, 70 years, living them with pain and agony, just to die and relive them again. Life after life, all ending with tragedy, losing loved ones, being humiliated, diagnosed with incurable diseases and much more. The narrator himself gives up, with the protagonist breaking and dying. A new chapter begins with the nightmare saying that she will see the protagonist again. Awakening in a wilderness devoid of any physics with a new voice forming called the Broken, someone who has had enough and wants to let the princess out as he cannot endure lifetimes of torture and agony. More voices keep pouring in, voices of the opportunist, the stubborn, the cold, the hunted, the contrarian and many more, being different versions of the protagonist than how he felt in each segment of the story. Going into the disintegrated cabin with all the voices seemingly having a moment of clarity that all their efforts are in vain and their fate is sealed. As they all tried over and over and never succeeded, the nightmare comes out of a hole and forces the protagonist to take her hand as he tries many times before to overcome her, in many chapters before when they step into the outside world. But of course, no matter how powerful, the nightmare is nothing but another vessel for the entity when she is surrounded by the long, quiet, and consumed. Even in the second chapter, leaving with the nightmare rather than resisting her leads to the same outcome. The voices who all wear contradictions and different bid each other farewell as they know it is the end, and being through worlds thanks to the nightmare making them live through it, they are fully accustomed to each other and now agree with each other. But of course, it's too late and they vanish when the protagonist approaches the mirror, seeing himself being unraveled. Meeting the entity, she explains that there is a world outside the limits of the one that they are in. There are people with infinite emotions, but unlike them, they are mortal. Finally, the entity explains that she is in the cusp of her awakening and all she needs is another vessel until all the other ones will follow suit and she would become whole. This would allow them to go to the space beyond, where they believe the narrator resides within. The final time the protagonist goes to the cabin, he's left with a few options only, going down empty handed and then going up to retrieve the blade. It makes the princess get on her guards, knowing what the protagonist has planned for her. As the protagonist goes down, she cuts herself loose, allowing her to charge at the protagonist freely and easily overpower him. The second chapter called Beast gives rise to the voice Hunted who correspondingly was hunted like a prey in the last chapter. Going down to the basement, it seems to have transformed into a habitat suitable for a large animal. That's when out of nowhere, a large beast charges at the protagonist and swallows him whole in one swift motion. 
It turns out the princess tried to drag the protagonist's body out with her again as she could leave the cabin, but it didn't work as he died, as if the ability to hop onto another world depends on both of them being together in unison. This time around, swallowing him whole might work. The stomach acid of the beast slowly melts and burns the protagonist until she leaves the cabin, spitting him out. But just then, the entity takes her body, with the protagonist yet again finding himself in the long quiet, faced with a mirror. This time around, instead of seeing himself, he sees a crow entity, which turns out to be no other than the narrator, the companion who narrated the entire premise and instructed the protagonist to slay the princess or the vessels which formed the entity. The mirror all of a sudden shatters into several shards still containing the essence of the narrator. The narrator explains that he is an echo, a remnant of the creator who made the protagonist the hero of the story, alongside all the other sides of him and the voices. Oh, I'm nothing like you. I am an echo, likely one of many. Somebody made you after all, and I am what's left of him. Not that I'm the only one who can make that claim, I'm sure you've met many others like me. This construct you're in exists in many places at once. Any time you failed, any time you thought yourself dead, it would restart and shunt both your consciousness and hers into another world. But you'll be awake soon, and then it won't be able to work like that anymore. He explains that the protagonist has led many worlds into extinction by not following his objective instructions. That's why he has come so far, even seeing the narrator, who is beyond the space designed for the hero. The narrator goes on saying each time the protagonist died and woke up in a new world, his consciousness only restarted and the princesses, but the worlds that they were in all were destroyed. The protagonist, rightfully angered that he and the princess were deliberately created to be the opposing forces just existing to be used, protests that the narrator did this and maybe all lives being destroyed is a deserved result of that. The narrator explains that he's just an echo of a dead man, and whatever he did, the crimes he committed against these two characters has nothing to do with the infinite lives out there which had nothing to do with it. Nobody alive has done anything to you. I'm all gone. But if you and the princess want to smite the rest of them for the crimes of a dead man, if you really want to be that petty, there isn't much I can do to stop you. The narrator reveals that the entirety of the void is actually the protagonist himself, the long quiet, a god capable of so much. However, this god is within a story and he's been created by the author, whose thoughts are echoed through the narrator, a remnant of him, a god created to rid the world of death. The narrator explains each version of him in each world had their own perspectives and had their own truths, denying that they remember the past. The princess contains death and suffering and that's why she needs to be destroyed, hence why the protagonist was created. The narrator, who is the remnant of the creator, explains the creator was a mortal human who created this magical world and construct and the two opposing characters in order to stop the end of the world, making the princess the death and the protagonist the hero. The echo explains the princess as the shifting mound or the ebb and flow, who has the capacity to change. She has the change or transformation, birth and death, simply an inevitable. She is what others perceive her, therefore explaining why what the protagonist perceived her as made her become just that. A nightmare, a beast, a damsel, or a witch. He explains the showing care will red suffering and death, but that would mean the protagonist would be alone for eternity in this construct. A bad bargain for the protagonist. The creator wanted to break the cycle and made a world which contained two pieces of a puzzle to solve death. Part of her is within the protagonist and part of the protagonist is within her. Hence why they keep getting back to each other and why he can kill her. Two parts that will always be in conflict. The oblivion and doomsday was coming and the creator had no other choice but to create this world to save his family, friends and descendants. He 
He then explains why he wasn't transparent with the protagonist from the get-go. As the princess is the shifting mound, the pattern of death and existence, a simple intrusive thought would have transformed her into the most powerful being out there, capable of leaving the cabin and destroying the world. That is, if the protagonist believed her to be as such, hence why the narrator avoided being honest. She is the shifting mound, the ebb and flow, the capacity to change. She is transformation, or most of it. Her nature is why I had to die, for she becomes that which others perceive her to be. But an echo can't perceive things, not in the way that people can. If you actually knew what she was from the start, if you knew her capabilities, a single intrusive thought could have instantly ended the entire world. The protagonist is then described as the long quiet, a god who was never living, only living when his mind was confined to the threads of this construct and one reality. But as now he learned the truth, he cannot well or perceive the princess to be anything else. That's when all the shards of the broken glass break and the echo is faded and gone forever, with the long quiet, a vast god in this construct having the ability to kill the princess and rid the world of death or join her and reign terror on the world beyond and all the other dimensions. Embracing the construct which is him, the flickering light, the shifting mount emerges, saying how much she has missed the protagonist and that they are finally awake they can do what they want. The princess explains that they were both created from one origin. The princess had a role to play and the protagonist was given a choice. She contains death in her multitudes. This means she has different possibilities, different patterns of life, diseases, accidents, heartbreaks, and much more which lead to doom. But at the same time, what is the meaning of life with no challenge and down moments which we can uplift from? Either way, the protagonist has a choice to make, to slay the princess or free himself and let her out of his confines, which is the construct, the long quiet, Hence why the princess depended on the protagonist to let her out. She was trapped within him. In this ending, choosing to wake up and free the princess, the entire construct becomes the protagonist. He expands and feels his body, which has been sleeping for eternity. Everything becomes him apart from the princess. His wings spread, filling the cosmos, but he is pressed against the glass of the construct and the infinite. Despite pushing hard, it does not break. The princess takes his hand and together, the unseen glass shatters, freeing them from their confines and construct, free to roam as the death and destruction. The universe opens to them and they observe infinite numbers of universes which they infiltrate and leave, leaving behind devastation and destruction, killing infinite number of living beings, planets, cosmos, and humans. Therefore, the princess was patterns and different outcomes, and the protagonist was the constant and fate, and the existence itself. They were bound within the universe to rid the world of pain and suffering and death. However, leaving the universe meant lack of existence, leading to destruction of universe, including the ones that they would infiltrate. In my opinion, it seems that the author or the creator was simply a writer who created a sub-dimension by writing the story, and the life carried on in this dimension. But of course, this is because his own world was coming to an end. So the princess and the protagonist going beyond the sub-dimension means that they they can go to different dimensions and quite literally destroy them. There are a few endings to the story, so keep tuned as I will make another video about it very soon.